My name is Samantha Conboy. I'm the current president of the CHC. And with me is, I have a and small I'm Tammy there. Herndon, executive <laughs> director, and we are so excited to be at this very first virtual global summit, JAHC. And we realized you have a choice in breakout room viewing. So thanks for choosing us. <laughs> we have a fun topic with lots of great information. So we will jump right in. Samantha will start us off um, as soon as I get the share screen going. So just give me one quick second. Okay, Sam, I think you are set to go. Can everyone see my screen and the start of the PowerPoint? Good deal. Great, okay, well, welcome again to our presentation. And today we're gonna to be talking about ways to promote the amazing power of homeopathy, which we all know, but to look at it beyond our own practices. And oftentimes, you know, especially when we're in school, we're so engrossed with getting that right remedy, helping our clients that we miss opportunities or there's other ways that we can get involved and share homeopathy with even even bigger audience. So today, even though Sam and I are the presenters, we are not the stars of this presentation. We are featuring homeopaths that truly embody and demonstrate um, homeopathy in action in their everyday lives and in their communities. And so while it's a very diverse group from all over our country, um, they are joined by by a few commonalities and the main one is um, we've we've pulled our own community the certified classical homeopaths um, who have taken the chc exam passed it and have become um, certified by the council for homeopathic certification and for those of you who aren't familiar with the process um, years of rigorous education and training lead into an exam application and then after you are certified this group upholds standards and ethics um, that meet our, our professional homeopathy community expectations. And so we picked this topic. I mean, homeopathy is worldwide used by over 200 million people. In the US, it's a little less, five, five million adults and one million children. And these are from surveys done quite a few years ago. So the numbers have probably increased since then. But we just know that there's more ways to reach people and to educate people about the, you know, the power of homeopathy. So we were looking at ways to where, where practitioners have gotten involved outside of, you know, the clinic, the four clinic walls or the client consultation. And also, you know, a lot of us come to homeopathy as a second profession. So maybe there's skills that you have from a, a previous career that you can really um, bring to the table and leverage to help the greater homeopathy community. Okay, sorry about that. Technical difficulties here. <laughs> My arrows went away. All right, so advocacy is our first topic. It's, it's way number one to promote homeopathy beyond your um, practice. And advocacy is about establishing a strong network within our community and something that's dedicated to spreading the awareness of homeopathy. And when we polled our folks that are into advocacy in their own communities, there were three primary um, themes that came out of that. Um, education is the primary avenue uh, to introduce when you are talking to people that are new to homeopathy, rather than, you know, my way or the highway, let me educate you about um, this amazing discipline. Um, also presenting it as just an alternative way of thinking, not in place of, that is quite helpful and will often uh, find more receptive audiences. And then considering that homeopathy advocacy does require a team approach rather than just some one person taking it on their shoulders, involve your fellow practitioners, your clients, consumers, or even um, you know, your legislators and, and lawmakers. Nancy Gales is our first contributor and her, oh, sorry, her um, 
keynote quote, I guess we could call it, homeopaths highlight the path to personal advocacy by being fully present on the front line. And what she means by this is just look for the opportunities. They will present themselves and be ready with your strong, consistent message about homeopathy. Um, she focused on our current situation in our world with the pandemic and COVID-19 and just some, some rallying points for us as practitioners to consider is that um, COVID-19 appears to prey on those with a weakened vitality and who better than, and what better than homeopathy to address vitality as um, within the whole person. Um, the mental and behavioral, challenge, behavioral challenges that uh, people are experiencing from uh, being isolated and unable to connect with their loved ones or friends or whomever, um, homeopathy again can help with that. And then looking back into our archives, Dr. Hahnemann explicitly described the need for public advocacy for things like clean air and clean water and healthy diet, which I think <laughs> with our current situation, we are all being thrust back into, um, I mean, we have no option. There is no takeout in, in many states. In my state, that's not even open yet. So um, getting plenty of fresh air and natural diet. Kelly Weatherly, um, says that when she went to Congress to um, help educate about homeopathy, that it was much like putting the, some of the consulting principles of homeopathy right to work in the halls of Congress, um, establishing that like um, meets like mentality, sharing the personal stories, um, ensuring remedy access. And that is of course something that's been on the forefront of all of our minds and developing relationships with the health advocates in Congress and, and the Senate. Um, in your own communities as well as the extensions into Washington. And finally, in advocacy and collaboration, Alexis chimes in about more about collaboration. Um, she works with um, a pediatrician in her area. And so when a medical doctor asks for her advice and treats her as an equal in front of patients, um, it just reinforces the legitimacy and the value of our profession. And that's, that's very exciting to hear that that's going on. Um, she gives her advice is, you know, collaborate with uh, the medical profession or, you know, work with them in a way so that it increases the chance for someone to be exposed to homeopathy, maybe completely new. And then also with your colleague, make sure that, you know, you are enriched in your practice. Sam? Yeah, so the second uh, area that we looked at was in emergency response. And, you know, now more than ever, we can see, you know, there's different things that are happening in our world that could really use some remedies, right? And um, two of our volunteers um, shared about this. And, and this is kind of going beyond, you know, the Arnica and Aconite that we might think of initially, but really to look at how to support um, the disaster victims, as, as well as the first responders, um, and looking at the homeopathic contribution, you know, to the general well-being and health of the whole community. And also, it's a great way to introduce people to those little white pellets that they might wonder, they might see at a health food store and wonder, well, what is that? Um, and so it's a great, you know, opportunity to share that. Uh, Mary Johnston um, uh, was in the help to do response from the the wildfires up in Northern California and felt it was a very gratifying to be of service in the collaborative group effort. Um, and then I think she just felt, she, she volunteered through IHAN, which is the Integrative Healers Network um, that helped to establish emergency response that allowed homeopaths and other um, complementary um, medicine um, practitioners to be a part of the group. So she helped in the, the wildfires up in Northern California, as I said, and it really helped to help with, uh, you know, the acute cases as well as, you know, maybe some longstanding issues. And then Myra Neeson also was um, able to give service and in, in, in that way up at the same um, thing. And she really felt like she made a difference in the people's lives and felt really well received by both the doctors and nurses that were um, participating as well. In the, in the Red Cross effort. Um, I think also she has, an, there's another slide um, with Myra, yeah. So again, she worked with IHAN up in the Chico um, fires and it wasn't just homeopaths, it was acupuncturists, naturopaths, massage therapists, 
I believe there was chiropractors. So it was just a group effort. And I think that's the thing. We all want to feel like we're doing our part and doing what it, you know, it's so, you know, amazing to be able to share homeopathy with the world and to use our skills where, you know, they're most needed in that, in that time of emergency. And then um, the next topic was free clinics. And so these, um, you know, can be great in offering for your community, either low cost or no cost. Um, and um, what, we, what the group gathered was just having your clinics near other basic needed services is really helpful. Um, you're looking at both acute and chronic cases and that there is some short-term success, but sometimes the follow-up is difficult to gain. Um, in, in these kind of situations. And Loretta um, Butehorn um, felt like the best part about operating a community program is the ability to give even a single dose of a remedy which might move them forward toward health. So just knowing that you're helping somebody um, who really needs it, not that we, you know, we all need it, but somebody who may need it a little bit more. Um, and just the, the heartwarming stories, um, and just offering what you can. And I love this, considering a community clinic, just do it. And that's always been something on the back of my mind, like, oh, I really wanna do that. So it was, it was really great to hear that inspiration. You know what, if you're thinking about it, just do it, just, just give it a try. And then Chris, Christine uh, Gorelli and Wanda Smith-Schick, um, they, they said that their mission is to provide affordable care for everyone. A sliding scale is, is available and no one is refused due to lack of funds. So they run a joint um, effort up in the, the Bay Area. And their free clinic uh, focuses on support for physical, cognitive, and emotional health. And they offer services to veterans and other economically disadvantaged people, again, through their, their low cost and uh, community clinics. And, and then Melinda McGee. Um, her experience with it, with it was, you know, what can homeopathy offer, judgmental free listening, and I think sometimes people needing uh, the low and, and you know, uh, sir, low cost free services, they do need just someone to listen, and I mean, I think that's where homeopathy and homeopathic practitioners can really shine. And the free clinics, uh, she had made a really good point, free clinics are never really free, there's a high price that people pay to get to have you know, who have gone through a lot in their lives to need free services. Um, many of them are head injury or abuse cases that Arnica and Aconite um, are a great starting point and that homeopathy offers a path to wholeness for them that they may you know, have not found in other modalities. So our next group, Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen, I see you're on the call. Thanks for joining us. Kathleen, and, <laughs> Kathleen and Mary are both um, in the Bay Area and um, their joint comment was extending our services beyond private practice. This is kind of like the what's, the what's in it for me, which is very um, necessary when, when you are working past your practice hours and then, you know, storing up your resources and then heading out again. Um, it's been impactful to them as a homeopath, as a community member, and then of course their, their communities have definitely benefited from this. Um, they give a couple of ideas about how clinics might be set up. One of their clinic is 100% pro bono, and so that truly is a volunteer uh, you know, gift of love effort. And then another clinic is actually um, grant funded through the uh, San Francisco's uh, soda tax, which is very exciting <laughs> to, to re, uh, refunnel that, infra, that um, I guess, that money from, away from other infrastructure into homeopathy. Um, both clinics offer services to the underserved communities in locations where people are already going for other kinds of services. And so that's where you can find some of the continuity of care that you, you might not have if you are just a freestanding clinic. Mm -hmm. um, Denise, um, on the East Coast is working in an outreach clinic in New York, and um, it says, continues to be one of the highlights of her professional career. I've even heard this, her say this in person, that it's just really rewarding. And that's what I think we're all, it's, um, it's really nice just to feel um, like we are doing something for our communities. 
It's actually a major New York City medical system. And they reached out to Denise about providing homeopathy along allopathy alongside of it. So that's exciting. And, you know, they, they went in with the idea that most of Kate's cases were going to be acute and they ended up being um, more constitutional. So if you go into a situation like this, be prepared to take a full case, analyze it, <laughs> make a recommendation in about 20 minutes. And so that really kind of gets, um, gets you on your repertory skills right there. And then the, the clinic's located next to a soup kitchen. So like the folks in the Bay Area, um, they are located where they're going to be able to see these people maybe again and again. So, Moving away from sort of the human services to um, more of the product services, uh, provings. Provings are a great way to outreach in the homeopathy community um, because if you think about it, it's benefiting all of us from practitioner to client to consumer. And so um, it's a way to explore our natural world through the provings um, to find out what might heal what. And it's just a, a remarkable process. And so we've got some interesting comments from our contributors. First, Kelly Callahan um, said that she had been on the prover side of things and was never really interested in the other side of things as far as reviewing, collecting, organizing. Um, but she was so fascinated by the experience as someone who likes to go deep and just understand what she's involved in. And so she defines two roles that you might um, link into if you become uh, involved in approving. There's the actual prover where you take the remedy and then there's the provers who there are the workers, we'll label them that, who actually review organized collate and she compares these two situations. The prover is like visiting a new destination for the weekend and you only really understand yourself. It's a very introspective process because you're you're looking for what's different from the from the traditional regular you. On the worker side, it's like relocating, learning a language, experiencing the culture, and you get to have that nice bird's eye view of everyone's parts and pieces of the proving. So I thought that was really interesting um, way to, to look at the different roles. Jason Eric Hennigy in the Midwest, um, this is what he loves about homeopathy. And especially the provings, the invitation to open up and just, embrace it experience, I'm embellishing his quote here, to open up and, and um, understand the world with curiosity and wonder. And that's an exciting quote because sometimes we could get a little bogged down in our day-to-day -day homeopathy lives. <laughs> and so keeping that sense of wonder keeps us on our toes. Um, and so looking at it from his perspective, when you're looking for the energy signature of a substance, you're trying to understand it first with greater, greater clarity. And you're motivated knowing that this, you know, unproven, uh, little known substance may be the just right thing to heal someone in their own suffering. And he describes the standpoint, experience that temporary symptom and become aware of that, that otherness that's not you and what it wants, needs, craves, doesn't like, and then the feeling of lifting, which, you know, leads to that stronger, more vital feeling of the self. I personally have never been an approving. I have to almost put on a beekeeper suit to uh, clean and organize my remedies. I'm super sensitive, but I can see how this would be quite uh, lovely to experience. And finally, um, Rowan Jackson out in New Mexico says that the provings are the cauldron from which the mysteries of homeopathy are discovered. So she speaks a little more from the alchemical standpoint. And she, she gives us um, just a couple of ideas to think about. Jeremy Scher noted that a broader social relevance um, is really attached to the provings and the miasms. And one of her many examples is the scarab beetles. Um, in, in, you know, in Egyptian burial, it's placed over the heart of the deceased. And, you know, not surprisingly in our world, the scarab is a heart remedy. I encourage you to uh, go back and find our February communique. Uh, it is on our website because she gives many, many lovely examples of how some of our world events uh, parallel what was being proved at the time. Uh, she also recommends a book by Jeremy called The Dynamics and Methodology of Homeopathic Proving. So sort of a, um, a how-to manual. It's available at dynamis.edu. Normally we wouldn't do a commercial, but 
all the proceeds go toward homeopathy for health in Africa. So it's a really great cause and you, you get a nice resource book. Um, and she just encourages us to uh, source her own, source a substance. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to be part of approving, but another role that one might play is actually finding the substance and sourcing it. And that gives you even a greater um, respect and understanding. Okay, moving on to publications, number five. Uh, we've, there's a gazillion of great publishers in our CCH community. Um, but we've just tapped a couple of them to share their thoughts. And really with both of them, a question or problem started their process. Like, how should I, or what should I, and how can we? And then it rolled into research. And then of course, the bottom line is improved client care. Um, and they, they both have said that that is what motivated them to keep going through the arduous process. First, David Johnson recently wrote a book and he said it started out with the goal of clarifying the homeopathic uh, periodic table. And you know, living in a, um, an equally minerally uh, part of our world like David does, um, the periodic table comes up quite frequently in clients. And so this is something that's always intrigued me. But it quickly took on a life of its own. And as with writers, I just had to write their words <laughs> instead of bullet pointing. So he said that wrapping words around imbalanced energy states refined his own understanding of the common and the uncommon remedies and also revealed how the periodic table is just a beautiful mirror of the human experience. And so that, that really is, is quite lovely. The name of the book is Radiance, Resonance and Healing. And it gives back to the profession by helping practitioners to confidently navigate and prescribe. And that, that was really David's goal in writing this book. And so there's more to follow on, on um, his experiences in our September communique. Next, we have Joanne May in Oregon, who um, has an also interesting publication. She writes that it was painstaking, extensive, exciting work that continues to improve the care of her clients, as well as deepen our knowledge and resources of information. And so Joanne May and her, her medical colleague, uh, David Fitton, uh, had collected, had amassed, you know, loads of great information about remedies and about cases over their clinical lifetime. And the question was how to categorize it and make it more accessible so that clients could continue to benefit from it. And so they have uh, created um, a repository of this information and it's arranged and tagged by themes with emotional, family, and physical files. And for example, anger is one. And they've got some really very interesting takes on anger. Um, it's many forms and expressions and more um, modernized language as well, because we've all had that frustration of going, if I could just fit that client's yeah. words into the repertory yeah. language. And so yeah. there'll be a lot more information uh, in our September communique about this one as well. So stay tuned. I was just thinking that myself, updating that, that those rubrics and the repertory to fit today's modern. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's a yeah. tough. It is. Uh, so number six is study groups. And, um, you know, it's something that as we leave school behind us, study groups, they're still important and they still provide a, um, they fill a need, you know, learning and they provide learning as well as community after our school experience um, and always also during. Uh, they have a platform or a way for people to question and, and practice, you know, let's all repertorize together or look at things, you know, together and not have to do it alone. And it just creates that support for homeopathy. But the challenge is the ups and downs of being a homeopath that we all get um, experience out in practice. Uh, Raquel Black uh, up in California uh, shares that we speak the same language and support each other in order to be effective in professional homeopaths. And um, she felt that, I can guess if you can move to the next slide, um, that, that the study group was like an extension of classroom teaching and it was a way for people to bring difficult cases that they were struggling with to the group, kind of that group think, like how can I solve this? And sometimes it's just so easy for as a group, you come up with something that you wouldn't necessarily come with, up with alone. And then also just studying remedies and comparing remedies um, is another thing that their, their study group does. And then Afrin Kazi, who I think is on our, our call as well, um, from Delaware, 
uh, shared that being a part of a study group has helped us understand how people are desperate to use homeopathy for minor illnesses on their family, friends, and pets. So it can be also a good um, entryway for consumers or, or you know, do-it-yourself uh, prescribers to, to learn more about homeopathy. Um, and it's a way for you know, outreach in the community as well as promotion at community wellness events. It's just a nice entryway for people who want to learn more and expand their knowledge. And we will hear more about study groups in the upcoming June communicate. And then lastly, we added this one. This one just is kind of hot off the press with everything that's happened in the last few months. Uh, we wanted to share um, what some of the CCHs are doing on virtual net networking. We're doing it right now as, as, as we speak. And it can provide connection despite the distance and give access you know, to information we wouldn't normally get access to with these um, homeopaths and um, teachers from all around the world. We're getting um, kind of getting to experience this weekend. And then you can participate on your own schedule, you know, which is a nice, a nice perk of it. Um, and we spoke with uh, Lori Grossman, who's the new uh, NCH president. And she felt uh, that this is an important time for homeopathy. And the hope is that you'll meet presenters, colleagues, and exhibitors, much like we might do in the hallways of our in-person conference. So just allowing that opportunity to happen, even though we're not able to you know, reach out and touch each other. Um, they've got the breakout uh, sessions that help to encourage the interaction. There'll be digital recordings, as well as contests and exhibits to engage and encourage fun. So we do have a scavenger hunt on our site which I'm sure you'll all be excited to go take because it actually is really fun. Tammy did a great job building it and there are prizes, so be sure to check it out. And then I think lastly, um, Kavitha Kukanor shared with us um, that virtual presenting is slightly different from in-person, but the, the essence of it is to speak your truth and be real and natural. Um, and I think she had a few uh, uh, blurbs of, of uh, inspiration to you know, meditate, get yourself grounded, even do like a mind mapping to learn about your audience um, and be relevant and engaging in your content and use social media Q&A sessions to encourage and maintain connections. So that's the great thing about virtual networking. It doesn't have to end, you know, after this weekend. And sometimes it's easier if we do have that, like I, I'm going to have people's emails that I wouldn't normally maybe get if I didn't, you know, find them in person. And thank you for coming today. We really appreciate your participation and um, are always open to learning more. So if you, um, you or one of your CHC colleagues is doing something unique or interesting, we'd love to feature them in the upcoming communiques. And I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. If anybody has any questions or comments and um, Well, I'll just make a comment if that's okay. This is Kathleen sure. Shibley. I just want to thank you, you, Sam and Tammy for putting this together. I just, I personally feel like all of these efforts and, and picking the ones that you resonate with the most, I think is important too, but like all of them are so important to the future of homeopathy. I mean, I really think this is the heart of where we're headed. So I think it's, it's really great. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks for all your work. And um, yeah, this is, you know, the, it's, it's, we brainstorm all the time. We have great volunteers and the, you know, one of our volunteers on the PR committee came up with this idea and it just kind of went from there. So um, we get to present it, but it's not always all of our ideas.